Hey listeners, I am excited to share with you this week uh, my interview with Paul Lamicella. He is a PhD student in biblical studies. Connected with him from a, a mutual friend who was listening to me talk about what I've been getting out of Bible college and just the discovering the Bible as one overarching story. And he was like, hey, you should interview Paul, who is in PhD studies for biblical theology, as well as has a course on discovering the storyline of scripture. And so I invited him on and I really enjoyed our conversation together, just talking about God's word, talking about the message of scripture and about the importance of biblical theology and seeing the story of scripture instead of just these random tidbits that we might read. This is probably the episode that I am most excited about in the last three or four months. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation together. If you would like to check out Paul's work, particularly his course on discovering the storyline of scripture, there is a Google form, both on the post of this podcast, in the YouTube uh, description, as well as in the show notes on iTunes, no matter where you're listening to it. Uh, you should be able to check it out. Um, sign out the Google form if you're interested, and he will let you know. I don't think they're running any of the of the conferences, the courses right now. He, he does them in a period of two weeks, I think, a two-week course, and it's pretty intense for those two weeks. But you can sign out that Google form and be notified when he does them again. So I hope you have had a wonderful weekend, a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm actually recording this intro on Thanksgiving morning, and I trust that this episode will be a blessing to you as you further discover God's message and his, his story of redemption that he is working throughout creation. If you have appreciated the podcast and would like to partner with us in support, I invite you to look us up on patreon.com forward slash Asher Whitmer, and then you can... Uh, support us for as little as five dollars a month and receive some extra bonus content in return you can check that out as well also be sure and rate and review the podcast on itunes or on youtube if you have found this helpful or if you have not found it helpful and you want to just let us know about your experience go ahead and leave a comment or a review or rating we appreciate that and now for my conversation with paul lamicello all right we are live it is Good to have on the podcast today, Paul Lamicella. Did I did I say that? That's right? good. Good to meet again, another person virtually. This has been the year. Um, I think in the last four weeks, there's been like three people, maybe four people that I've met virtually, just doing interviews. Um, so we'll continue that streak here with you. Thanks for taking the time to come on. Happy to. Yeah, so for for my listeners, um, I do not know Paul personally until now. We were chatting a little bit before we hit recording, but uh, a good friend of mine, Dwight Gingrich, had referenced him as we were talking one day, just kind of uh, some of the things I was learning about in Bible college and just sharing how the discovering the story of Scripture has has really brought Scripture alive, brought... um, even just history alive in a way, seeing uh, what God is doing and working towards. And he just mentioned that uh, Paul is, he, I think he said his words were like, you should have Paul on the podcast because um, it's something you're passionate about and something you have a course on, I believe. And you just thought it would be a good resource, good guy to chat with on this conversation. And so I reached out to Paul and, and he was willing to come on. Do you have, I know a couple years ago, you did a course, at least uh, Dwight had sent that link to me. Um, have you been doing that course still? Obviously with COVID, maybe things are changed up. Yeah. Um, so I have done it basically once a year for the past five years or so. Okay. Six, 2016 was the first time. Um, I did it earlier this year. Like it actually was like the last thing that I did, almost the last thing I did before the world shut down. Okay. Um, but, uh, so I anticipate hopefully, you know, um, running it again, but, um, you know, I think all of us have been learning what James, uh, says about not knowing what, what, the what tomorrow may hold. So, yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So maybe sometime, maybe sometime next, next year, depending on how things work out. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, and I'd like to get into that a little bit later. First of all, why don't you just share a little bit about yourself, some of your background, your upbringing, and then um, your kind of your, you're in the middle of finishing up your PhD. And you could tell some of your educational journey as well. Yeah, so um, we, uh, my wife and I live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, we uh, attend a uh, Anabaptist church here. Um, originally, our, my folks are from New York City, um, and uh, but moved to PA when I was ten. So I've I've lived in Pennsylvania, grown up most of my life here. Okay. Um, got married to my beautiful Laura um, last August, so August of 2019. And, uh, that's been, that's been wonderful. Mm. Um, it's been, uh, it's been great to watch, a, a sort of be a small, a part of a small microcosm of the divine story, uh, seeing that play out mm. in marriage. So, mm. um, yeah. And then as far as education, um, so I'm, yeah, like, um, like Asher said, I'm in working on my PhD in biblical theology currently, um, so it's been a long road. Um, did my undergrad years ago, then my master's, and I am two thirds or more of the way done with PhD. So I've got another year or so left. Um, I'm PhDs are usually so PhDs come at the end of the road after you know undergrad and a master's, and it involves uh, in America at least involves uh, a couple of years of coursework, and then big comprehensive exams and then a dissertation which is at least a couple hundred pages usually on some very specific mm. academic topic so i am writing mm. on i'm uh, working right now on the dissertation part on the use of the old testament in second peter oh, okay. so. interesting yeah we just chatting a little beforehand uh we're actually the same similar age paul is 30 i'm 29 we'll be 30 in a few months here somewhere <laughs> and uh but you're in your PhD. I'm just getting started on this journey. And uh, I, I look, when I started college, I thought, well, I'm, I just want to study. Like, I don't, <clears throat> excuse exactly. me, I don't know why I'd go for a master's or PhD. Like, I just want a little more training. And it didn't take me real long to realize that, like, oh, bachelor's is like this skim over the top of everything. <laughs> and you just, like dip your toes in enough of the the deeper subjects to get to learn a lot of new questions and be like wait wait what what about that and phds masters maybe zooming in a little bit more narrowed on a topic and there's definitely a few few realms that i would be interested in i don't i don't know if our stage of life will ever afford that but um what it's interesting. You're you're studying specifically the the Old Testament use in. Did you say Second Peter? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings up a question that I've had, and maybe you're, um, I I, yeah. I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts. I grew up Anabaptist, and Anabaptists are very known for a focus on Jesus. And mm-hmm. Kind of everything starts with Jesus, and then you go out from there. The more, like, as I'm taking my college degree, which is a biblical studies, um, a bachelor of biblical studies, and the focus, like, I don't, obviously, I'm not sure how other colleges do it. I'm, I don't know if this was in your, the college you went to, if this was the intentional focus or not. But um, at Eternity Bible College, they study biblical theology as opposed to systematic theology where... Well, there's there's several things that differentiate that, but one of the things is that um, we're starting by just reading through the whole story. So, like we read through the Bible, the first, I mean, it, you, it's it's stretched out over a year, over years, but um, we read it over and over again, and then we go back through and walk through mm. the text more directly in mm. some some different uh, challenging texts, maybe and. Uh, and so the in doing that in kind of the overview and the the Old Testament surveys, New Testament surveys, I've discovered 
and then the Old Testament module, especially where we go in deeper, I've discovered how much Jesus is pulling from the Old Testament, pulling from the Torah, mm-hmm. and then even other New Testament authors. I, I'm I'm not I'm just now getting into the New Testament section of right. the degree, so I haven't gotten into Paul really. Just kind of did an overview of the New Testament, um, but I've I've come to value a strong understanding of the old Testament or even just a strong, um, even if I don't understand it all, but a strong knowledge of the old Testament, like what went on and what was taught. Um, as I now enter into Jesus and I'm starting to read his stuff Mm -hmm. and his teaching comes more alive to me now that I know the old Testament better. Is there, do you, do you find that we, we can't really separate the two? Like maybe, Maybe we need a strong Old Testament awareness or teaching in order to better understand the New Testament. I, I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah. It, there's so much to say on that, but Jesus' understanding of him. And so um, when you look at how he understood his relationship to Scripture, uh, you can't understand him apart from understanding um, what he thought scripture was and the story that he understood it to tell. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I mean, and the exact same thing for the apostles. Um, So, I mean, we could go so many places, but the apostles were, it's interesting in Acts, Paul says that, um, I think it's when he's talking to Agrippa and he says, look, I'm just saying all I'm teaching is what the what you know the 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 prophets said would happen that the Messiah would suffer and then bring light to the Gentiles. Um, mm-hmm. When you the 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 apostolic witness is is absolutely saturated in and shaped by the uh, the vision of the the story of the Old Testament. Um, mm-hmm. You can't understand what Jesus means by the good news of the kingdom of God without understanding what Isaiah means by that, uh, because Jesus is pulling directly from Isaiah. And the, the, the danger comes when we think we can, and so we just like read, read the New Testament text with sort of no, none of that Old Testament context and just make up our own definitions for the terms. Uh, we mm. miss so much. So, mm. yeah. 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 So for, for our listeners, um, I don't, I don't know if this is, I think it's gaining popularity maybe in the last few years, but I don't know if this is a new concept, understanding this, this understanding scripture as a story that God is revealing or kind of unfolding, playing out. Um, I think it's N.T. Wright talk, excuse me, talks about the the scenes, six scenes of scripture mm-hmm. and uh, understanding life, I guess you could say as a play. Right. And we have six scenes in scripture and we're in the fifth scene. Mm-hmm. Um, the, right. Some, some of my audience would be familiar with that, but um, yeah, the, obviously the last scene being the completing of redemption. Right. What, Maybe I'll just jump in with this question. What? Um, so you have a course on understanding the story, the mm-hmm. biblical story. Mm-hmm. What is your motivation? Like, what has? Why have you? Why did you start that course? What? Why is your PhD on biblical studies? Like, what? What's kind of your personal drive behind that? Yeah, I think um, some of it actually started many some years ago now um when church we were at it's not the same one we're at now but um was going through some uh let's just say very bad time uh mm-hmm. and there was a lot of uh basically it exploded um mm-hmm. to use the technical term but uh and uh, it, watching sort of what happened and watching the a lot of what happened to the young people in that situation, uh, so many of them 
lost their way and they were like a few years younger than me but there's this whole group of, of kids um that at the time were 16 17 i guess that just they just you know had majorly hard times and i i think that impacted me thinking of you know people in these young people in these situations need to have a a vision of christianity that's that is beautiful and big and um and true and good that's mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. sort of dependent on and not that isn't tied up with the ugliness that was mm-hmm. you know happening in that situation at the time mm-hmm. and um so i think that 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 was part of the impetus and then when i went to school um i was then sort of i had some amazing professors who um really helped biblical theology come alive to me and really was you know similarly like to you i think captivated by the uh the richness and the beauty of the bible story and the centrality of jesus and you know the gospel in the middle of it and uh i think you just you know wanted to impart that vision uh you know in whatever ways i could so yeah. um yeah i think that we can go, we are called to love i mean ultimately bible study is for the purpose of loving god and loving others mm-hmm. and we do that through i think seeing how god in jesus has pulled us into this this story that um uh, we have no right to be part of apart from yeah. the fact that you know he's died for us and called us to be yeah to be swept into it yeah yeah it seems like it's so easy for us to and i don't i don't think anybody does this intentionally but to get focused on like specific aspects of scripture of the story we talked about jesus starting with jesus earlier but even other new testament writings that tell us what to do and how to mm-hmm. do it um and and we lose sight especially uh, i think about with my kids i've got my kids are young, so they're, they're still getting into the stage, but I've got a seven and six year old and just realizing that like we, we, our perspective of God is shaped very early on as we, as we, as we see our parents relate and as we see what our parents, hear what our parents say about God and then see how they live. Um, and if all if all, if all I'm giving them is, which I think it's good to focus, do a study through. I mean, you've got 20 years with your kids, right? You could right. You have all kinds of family studies, but um, one of the things that I've started doing this year, started in January, was just I just want to read the story to my boys so that mm-hmm. they're from very early getting that story, getting the. Mm-hmm the beauty actually using a, a plan from Dwight for beginners oh, nice. reading that skips, you know, obviously it doesn't walk through all the, yeah. Skips numbers. Uh, <laughs> <which is great>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but just to catch that, that overarching right. story. Exactly. Um, because then in those moments, like when churches explode, when Christianity seems like it's ugly, if we don't have that vision, if we don't right. understand even like where ugly relationships and churches wrestling and figuring out relational things, like if we don't even understand where that fits in the whole right. redemption story. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I think it makes sense why so many yeah. of our young people yeah. would get lost. And, right. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. What has been your, um, as you've, you've said, you say you've been running these courses for five years. Yeah. Something like that. On, have you had a lot of people attending them or what's Yeah, I, the, I keep them small, um, yeah. you know, 15 to 18 per, per yeah. t- each time. I yeah. like a smaller feel so it's interactive and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. What, what do you cover in a course like that? And it's a weekend? Well, no. Um, oh, okay. It's two, I usually do it a two week intensive. Uh, Oh, okay. It's pretty, yeah. yeah it's yeah. kind of, you know, uh, I've done other things too. Like I've, I've done, um, 
you know, spoken at youth Bible school things where I just do an yeah. hour a day for five days or something. But like my sort of my understanding of storyline class it traditionally has been a two week uh, intensives, like four hours of class time per day for 10 days. Okay. Um, and then a bunch of reading and assignments and stuff like that. So it's, yeah. it's sort of like, you know, uh, a good yeah. thorough introduction to, um, to stuff. So we usually start, we, yeah. we start off with just a overview of, of kind of the sweep of the Bible story from Genesis to revelation. Um, and then we, uh, kind of zoom in and talk, we spend a good amount of time working through the major biblical covenants and showing how they mm. push the storyline forward. Um, mm. And uh, and really help set the sort of the framework of of understanding scripture, um, and then uh, then from there we spend some time looking at more detailed issues in hermeneutics. So uh, how to understand, for example, sort of how does typology work? Um, understanding different genres of t- of text, especially like tricky ones like um, apocalyptic and some mm-hmm. of the prophetic and poetic literature. Um, and then we talk some about uh, New Testament use of the old. Um, mm-hmm. And then we sort of the last few days trace some major themes through the Bible. So we spend okay. some time, we trace like the theme of temple, the theme of, um, mm-hmm. of uh, kingdom and mm-hmm. atonement and stuff like that. So that's kind of the basic yeah. shape of it. Oh, that sounds good. It'd be interesting to to go through it. I've often um, wondered, like, how do you? <laughs> I I speak every now and then here in our church, and mm-hmm. it's like you can't in thirty minutes, forty minutes. You can't. Feels like it's really hard to for people who might not have that right. background to pick a passage and then like explain like why this <laughs> why this passage is so significant or big right without yeah. like going back through some of the the whole story the backstory yeah yeah so i've wondered yeah how would how would you do that if you're doing like a uh abbreviated or shortened course how would you do that if you're doing a short version so that's a long version see there i i set it up myself so i can make it as long yeah. as i want right yeah. so um I mean, that's like 35 hours of class time, but for a short thing, you know, it, it's just, you do the best you can. I think the key is you try to imbibe, you try to really, um, let yourself be saturated by and shaped by the, the story of scripture so that it can, you, it can come out whatever way it needs to. So, you know, you have a 30, one 30 minute sermon to give, it will, it will, um, yeah, you'll, you'll shape your sermon accordingly. If you have a week mm. long, you'll do that. It, it, you know, it, it, it's gotta be context specific. There's not a really yeah. magic bullet. It's, um, yeah. but yeah, I think yeah. giving, you can even in fairly small, fairly short situations, give people a sense of connectedness like how does this yeah. how does this yeah. passage one of the one of the things that i try to have help my any when i teach help people come away with is i think one of the most practical things you can do is remember that when you're interpreting a passage of scripture you need to look at we always talk about reading scripture in context but mm. what i tell them is is and this i get from other people um is you need to think through three contexts, you know, the immediate literary context. That's what we always think. We often think mm-hmm. we're doing a good job if we get there, you know, but no, that's only the first of the three contexts. Then you need yeah. to think about all of redemptive history prior to this, that's led up to this passage. That's the second context, the prior mm-hmm. context. And then you need to think of the entire canonical context. How does, how does this passage, you know, fit with what comes after it as well as what comes before it. And only Mm -hmm. then will you really understand the full context of, of the given passage. So, you know, that's a, it's a good heuristic, but just like any, I think it's just like knowing a person or understanding, uh, appreciating art or anything else like that. It's something that you, you, you sort of, you don't just learn all at once. You, it's a mm-hmm. lifelong pursuit, really. Mm-hmm. 
And even, I don't know if you, um, I'm sure you've heard this, the, uh, as the Torah as meditation literature. So like the first five books, especially Mm -hmm. so intended in Jewish Judaism, it would be intended to not just like we as 21st century Americans, like our books to be like, I can sit down and read and I know exactly what I need to do. Right. After five minutes of reading or whatever. Right. And it's intended that you meditate on it and immerse yourself in it over and over again. Right. In order to get the whole gist right. of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we, we often tend to think of the Bible as, as telling us what giving us sort of a, a bunch of specific rules that we need to follow. And there's, yes, there's plenty of rules in even the new Testament, but mm. I think the way it's primarily designed to shape us is by forming us into certain kinds of a certain type of person hmm. who, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's how a story shapes you. Um, yeah. It's, it's to it tell, it gives you a role to fulfill in a, in a, in a drama. And then yeah. when you, once you have that, and that's what Wright talks about this and other people as well, but yeah. um, then you, you can, you, that, that's what actually shapes you into a certain type of person. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the rules and stuff find their place in that. Like I, I obey, we follow these rules, not just for arbitrarily, but because um, of our relationship to Jesus and this larger story. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. What have been some of the things that as people have taken the course that has shaped them, like that they, they didn't see before they didn't have this connected. What are some of those major things? Things you've um found. yeah i i i think uh the connection between the old and new testament hmm. um i remember one student who wrote saying that she um metaphorically talking about the blank page in between the old testament new testament and her bible yeah. and uh you know it, it, you know every bible has this you know this blank, this blank yeah. page yeah. and she was saying how she now sees that in a sense that blank page is gone and then and, and she understands how these you know these these things connect yeah. um yeah and just i think i hope you know some people have caught a vision for the beauty of of god's faithful faithful um steadfast love and yeah. demonstrated in how he has worked shaped history yeah. um and the bible yeah 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 that's good um so i i don't know if like there's there's these terms that if you're in bible biblical studies or something you you're familiar with that other people there's not really any reason right. why why we understand <laughs> academics but, um, like to have special terms just so that they can feel like they are smart. But, feel, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's but um, one of the things that I uh, a term I didn't even know I, um, EBC emphasized that they do biblical theology as opposed to systematic Systematics, theology, uh-huh. and I didn't even really know what all that meant right. until probably my third semester in. But the focus of doing biblical theology is where we are immersing ourselves in the text and learning to ask the questions that the text mm-hmm. invites us to ask of itself. Mm-hmm. Systematic theology is like take abortion, for instance. The Bible does not talk about abortion. It talks about the killing of, of infants. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it talks about murder. So systematic theology says, how do we understand what should be the ethics on abortion? Well, we right. go and see what what the Bible has to say about murder and babies and life and all of that. And then we draw an ethic, a biblical ethic on abortion. Um, I would have grown up and I don't I don't know that there's anything wrong with systematic theology as opposed to biblical theology, as long as we're like you talked about with the three contexts, we're not just proof texting like random right. things. But I would have grown up in a primarily systematic way approach to the Bible where we're, mm-hmm. we're um, you know, kind of the classic, I guess, is how old is the earth? You know, and so we take those questions to Genesis 1 
and maybe miss the actual stage that's being set in Genesis and and some of the themes that are no nowhere else really in scripture do the biblical authors seem concerned about the age of the earth as much as some of the other things like for instance the the concept of man seeing with their eyes something that looks good and wise and and then doing what is right in their own eyes like that's a theme that we trace all throughout um talk a little bit what is what is kind of your perspective is there do you have a, a preference one or the other what what might be some unique strengths to biblical theology that where we're at least getting the foundation, even if we go on to do systematic theology, like getting a foundation of what the Bible actually finds important. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously I like biblical theology because I'm doing a PhD in it. So yeah, <laughs> that, you know, shows my hand a little bit, but um, you know, in defense to systematics uh, it's, it's a necessary and a good thing. Um, is just both have a, both have a role to play. And I think, you know, um, one professor has talked about the different sort of the relationship between the two is like biblical theology is kind of like a road that you actually drive on. And then, Mm -hmm. but systematics is like the guardrails. You don't like drive on the guardrails, but you need them there because when you start swerving, you're like, (laughs) you know, and you're like, Oh, right. Okay. So I think, I think I was just, you know, getting off track here and the, the the systematics reminded me no 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 you you know don't deny the trinity or something like that you yeah. know and uh so they 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 both have important roles um when done well i think systematics can often be done poorly and mm-hmm. that's why some of it is is sort of unhelpful but when it's done well what systematic theology essentially does is work through biblical theology and then draw conclusions so Mm -hmm. it's biblical theology is for your listeners who aren't familiar with the terms biblical theology sort of takes a linear approach to reading the bible and says well how does the how does this theme or this topic develop through scripture and that development itself is important it's not like we're just like you know trying to get to the destination mm. it's like no no how does god work how, how does this like this theme of kingdom or or temple for example like how has god worked through history through redemptive history to um you know to sort of reveal himself uh in this motif or theme um systematics on the other hand is more so if if um biblical theology is like a line uh systematics is kind of like a little circle where we just mm-hmm. we like to we draw a circle and a, a category of a just a discrete little unit um, where we want to say so what does the Bible as a whole sort of conclude on a certain topic and um, we need both really because fundamentally I think biblical theology is really important to our day to day life because it, we want to we want to be drawn into the world of the of the Bible. Um, we don't, we want to not just like say, no, I'm going to stay in my world and I'm going to try to pull the Bible into my world. No, I want to, I need to be sort of pulled into the Bible's world. At the same time, um, we do need to be asking the questions of like, well, in my setting, in my environment today, I'm dealing with real contemporary life. And, you know, in light of the Bible story, what can I put together that will, that will, you know, sort of tell me what is what god thinks is true on on a various various issues so you know yeah yeah no that's good um that's, that's a good distinction that uh systematic theology done well will go through the biblical theology and then draw that conclusions yeah. from that yeah i had a professor at at southern who um steve well steve wellham who's a technically a systematics guy but he is very heavily involved in biblical theology as well and yeah. his systematics stuff was always so good like he i mm. uh did a, he did a class on christology and like half of it was biblical theology and wow. then yeah. he starts drawing systematics conclusions and stuff and that that really works yeah. um, so what um 
what what are some maybe uh typical or not typical but easy errors to make if we don't do a good job of biblical theology what are in in just kind of a lot of the our teaching i don't i'm not intending so to pick one, on anybody but i'm just yeah <laughs> yeah i'm not going to give names um <laughs> but one so one thing i think that is that is quite common for us to for many people to do is what one of my professors has very funnily called uh, viking exegesis so hmm. the uh <laughs> the vikings um back in the day would uh sort of go to england or wherever and sort of get in there make a raid pull stuff out and get out of there as fast as they could hmm. mm-hmm. and um you know too often some of us do that with the bible we like open the bible go in grab a verse pull it out as quick as we in like you know, close the Bible as quick as we can and, um, and miss where the, where that verse is situated and, and stuff. So yeah. I think Viking exegesis is something, a trap that, uh, it's very easy for us to fall into, um, yeah. just picking isolated verses and, and sort of <laughs> like, almost like we're on a Bible verse raid, um, yeah. you know, and so, I think that's common. Yeah. <laughs> Jer- Jeremiah twenty nine eleven is maybe an example of that where we yeah it, yeah that is um, there's a lot of examples I mean like <laughs> it happens a lot yeah, yeah. you know but uh, the big takeaway is um, verses don't really the Bible doesn't work I mean it, yeah our Bibles have verse numbers but they are irrelevant. For yeah. you know, they, they don't pretend they're not there. So I mean, they, the reason they exist is simply to help us find, uh, you know, the same place in the Bible because we all have different, different editions of the Bible with different page yeah. numbers. So we need verses, you know. But mm-hmm. they, they don't have any. They don't. We we treat them as though they make they sort of encapsulate little discrete units of mm-hmm. of biblical knowledge or something. Mm-hmm. And of course, yeah. that's not how it is. It's uh, yeah. literature doesn't work that way. I mean, except for yeah. the book of Proverbs, maybe, but like, yeah, there's uh, genre that might be. Yeah. Even more, there it's, but yeah. So that, um, you know, thinking of the, thinking, honestly, I, I just really think that thinking of the Bible as detached from the story that it is a part of, um, mm. and its context is just the big sort of mm. error mm. because that, I mean, that just generates, a ton yeah. of other problems, you know, yeah. asking yeah. really obscure questions, just questions that the Bible really has no interest in, ans- at, in yeah. answering. Yeah. Um, sort of, sort of almost making our own definitions for biblical mm-hmm. things. So like kingdom is a perfect example, right? So we're like, oh, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is sort of a, sort of a, popular motif these days in in various circles uh, it's kind of interesting but often what happens is we're like oh kingdom cool what's a kingdom and we're like well let's see a kingdom uh a kingdom has a king and what else uh subjects and yeah. laws and there we go and so then we like go to the bible and say the new testament we're like ha look at that there's jesus he's the king and then Subjects, oh, that's us, and then laws. Uh, oh, that's the Sermon on the Mount. And like we think we've understood what the kingdom of God is. Yeah. We, all we've done is take a <laughs> take in a word that's in that, that Jesus announces, you know, the kingdom of God has come, and then try to read our own understanding of what that means into the text. Whereas Jesus' first hearers would have had a very different conception of what he meant because they understood his the background of Isaiah where the kingdom of God entails the fact that Yahweh is coming back to restore his people from exile to redeem them from their sins to restore the world um, to even to restore creation and to bring in in some obscure way to bring in the Gentiles yeah. uh, and this would somehow is all linked to the coming back of this David figure to reign over them and who's also somehow linked to this figure who i mean the davidic figure seems to also be the guy who the suffering servant who 
mm-hmm. brings atonement to Israel and stuff. And um, that's what Jesus has in his mind when he says the kingdom of, you know, proclaims the good news that the kingdom of God is, is coming. Yeah. Um, and if, then when you, when you see the, when you read the gospels, then in that light, you know, so much stuff just like really opens up in, in terms of Jesus on ministry. Um, and then even then, I think even for something like the Sermon on the Mount, so the Sermon on the Mount goes from then being, these are Jesus new laws to being, no, this is, I think, a, a picture of what Jer- the promise of Jeremiah 31, when Jeremiah says, I will, in the new covenant, mm-hmm. I will write my Torah on your, on your heart. But what would a heart written, heart inscribed Torah look like? Sermon mm-hmm. on the Mount. That's what mm-hmm. it would look like. You know, why does Jesus ditch, why does Jesus ditch certain things, certain aspects of the Old Testament law? Well, which ones does he ditch? He ditches the divorce, the allowance for divorce. Why does he do that? Well, he tells us, he says, Moses allowed you to do that because of the hardness of your hearts. But under the new covenant, Jeremiah says that, no, God's going to give you soft hearts and and stuff. And so any, any of that, all those, those sort of allowances for hard heartedness are gone. We're taken mm-hmm. out because the promise is when when you know when the Messiah comes and re- and redeems and renews his people, he'll soften our hearts and so we will gradually, slowly, imperfectly um walk in that hard inscribed Torah way that the Sermon on the Mount uh, sort of visualizes. Yeah. Wow, that's that's good. That is understanding the the whole problem of reading in our interpretations or definitions of things um is an issue that takes intense work to undo like have have you thought about that? like you can even even just going through a class on or or going through biblical studies like you i find myself still like it takes work to remind myself what the or let me rephrase it like me assuming i know what the mm-hmm. what um jesus means by kingdom or whatever is right. is such a natural instinct we don't we don't even necessarily think of that we're we're not even aware that we're how you described it like oh what is a kingdom oh it's got subject laws and right, right. we we can do that almost instantly right and to to say, wait a minute, let's go back and you know what what would the kingdom have been? Even is that is the kingdom like I didn't even know the kingdom was a theme throughout the Bible, right? Until I thought that was a Jesus theme. Yeah, it's until, not. It's massive from yeah. Genesis one. Genesis one. It starts at, at the beginning of creation. Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's with, uh, God creating male and female to rule over His creation. Mm-hmm. That's that's mm-hmm. the very beginning. So, yeah, kingdom of God is like an enormously huge theme. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I you, think mm-hmm. go for it. No, I was just gonna say, like, basically, the solution I think is to just keep reading the Bible. Yeah. Like, there's not we can't. It's not gonna be an instantaneous thing where okay, we we uh, are now zapped with the correct <laughs> understanding, but yeah. it's more of getting more more and more familiarity where. Um, you read stuff in the New Testament, you're like, wait a minute, I, that sounds like something I just read recently in Deuteronomy. Huh. Mm-hmm. Or, ha, sheesh, that sounds like Isaiah. And that sort of thing. That's that's the yeah. way, I think that's the way it happens. Yeah. So what do you recommend? This brings me to a question that I um, I don't like because I'm not, uh, read, reading is very hard for me. Mm. It's not natural. Mm-hmm. But being forced, the fact that I'm paying whatever it is, $150 <laughs> it's not the credit an hour <laughs> to do this has forced me to read through or even just listen through can, can, can help um, a large portion of scripture in a short amount of time. That, I would say, like there's definitely value in meditating. We, we were even just talking about the, the Torah is Jewish meditation literature where uh-huh. we're kind of sitting in and thinking on it. But it's, we don't think of kingdom with Jesus because it's August and we read Genesis. I mean, 
sorry, we, we don't think of kingdom in the Old Testament or in right. Genesis because it's August and we read Genesis in January. And, right, right, right. <laughs> you know, we right. lost touch of that. Is there, do you, do you suggest reading more condensed, condensely? Or how, do, how if you're going to read at a slower pace, how can you do it in a way that keeps the whole story in perspective? Uh, I think it varies. I don't think there's one good thing to do. I like uh, a Bible reading plan or a, or something like the McShane one that where you're you read four different in four different places of the Bible at any given time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, but that's good for has everything has their pros and cons. Then there's other there's there's something good about just like reading the whole book of Genesis, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it, I think some of both is probably a good approach. And then I think you still need to read other books, listen to other things that will help get your mind out of the rut that it will norm naturally yeah. be in because, you know, you need, you need voices from the out, outside of yourself to point out things that you would just naturally not see. And yeah. once that happens enough times, then you start on your own seeing the stuff everywhere. So, you know, some reading some good, some good literature or watching videos or whatever, um, can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Helpful. Are you, f- that, that reminds me of the Bible project. Are you, yeah, that's my with reference them? to the videos. Yeah. yeah. I love the Bible project there. Yeah. yeah I, I love that too. My boys love them. So yeah, that's, <laughs> they're, into- they're, they're great. Um, I, I show some of them in my class sometimes. Yeah. We, uh, I think so far for all my Bible classes, we've watched the the videos as we go through them, as we go through the text. Um, and there's, if you're not familiar with the Bible project, they're just short, uh, maybe eight minute videos. I don't think they get a whole lot longer than that. They're usually five to six minute videos that just, they have several different, they have some on specific themes throughout scripture but uh specifically i'm referring to the reading scripture videos that go through each book of the bible and just kind of give the overarching story of that book and then they do a good job of connecting it with the overarching story of scripture and so i've heard uh john i forget what his name is tim mackey tim mackey's kind of the Bible right. scholar behind it, but guy, ju- yeah. the other guy <clears throat> has done a lot of study and research in, in knowing how to combine visual and written text uh, and audio so that he can get communicate more really in job. five minutes than what someone could in an hour. It's yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Anyways, um, one, one question that I have is, and I don't know if all like if if this is typical with biblical theology or not, but at EBC, we read through the old Testament in according to the Hebrew canon. So it ends yep. with Chronicles mm-hmm. instead of Chronicles coming immediately after Kings and wondering why, why it's that way. But um, I found that I found the the Hebrew structuring, maybe it's just because it was new, but I found it to be crucial to helping me catch that overarching story do you resonate with that or do, what are your thoughts yeah. on that is it that- um just in case some of your listeners don't know what yeah on earth we're talking about um the uh so we're we're not talking about any difference in in the books of the of the old testament yeah. we're yeah. talking simply about the arrangement so in our english bibles going back i think to the septuagint the way the septuagint arranged um the books we uh, we're used to sort of a somewhat more chronological organization, not fully, but you know something along those lines. The Hebrew, mm-hmm. the original sort of Hebrew ordering, however, was um, is referred to as the Tanakh, referring to this, there's three divisions. So there's the Torah, which is the five the first five books of, of Moses, and then the the, um, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and these are these refer these are split up into the former prophets and the latter prophets and this includes our historical books most of our historical books judges joshua judges samuel and kings um 
and then the latter prophets. So it's the the big three: Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the, the twelve minor prophets. And then there's this third section called the Ketuvim, the writings. And these are the biggest book in this selection is in this section is the Psalms. Um, and then there's uh, other wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Ruth, uh, usually, and um, and then Chronicles and Daniel mm. and a few other things like that. So there's historical reasons why the order is that way. Um, it, it Yeah, but um, I... I'm a fan of it. I, I mean, I think that's, I mean, if I had my way, I would, that's the way I would print by, I would print Bibles because it's, it's an ancient, yeah. uh, it's, it's the way that the apostles and Jesus would have probably thought of the, I mean, did we know thought of the Bible? Mm-hmm. Um, because Jesus refers to the, to the, to scripture as in a you know, with these three divisions, when he talks about the, um, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Mm. Uh, he's making reference to those to those divisions. I don't think there's anything. I don't know that it makes an enormous difference. Um, the biblical authors usually um, their arguments from their the way they view scripture is usually along redemptive historical lines, and so the order of the books isn't the literary order of the books isn't like as like super super critical um i think it's a nice i think it's a nice touch to um think about them the way that jesus would have but Mm -hmm. um okay you know but it's not you know it's not like we're uh i don't know i so i don't know if you're familiar with uh stephen dempster's book dominion and dynasty i've i've heard it referenced but I've that's an awesome book so that Mm -hmm. it's a it's a biblical it's a theology of the old testament uh, and he structures it according to the Hebrew canon order hmm. and makes a really good it, – it's really, really, really well done. It's not too long, and it's an amazing overview of sort of the way the Hebrew Bible is, works and is put together and how the shaping of it um, helps helps us to, to, to grasp the story of the Old Testament. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that's great, but yeah. Yeah. I don't think uh, – at the end of the day, it doesn't. It's not going to change many exegetical decisions or anything. Yeah, no. It for me, it's just. It was beautiful to see. I think one of the kind of ribbon or bow on the present kind of thing was. So we have kings, mm, yeah, first and second kings, and then chronicles, and they're right. so similar that you can right. kind of die out. Where <laughs> yeah, chronicles yeah. is supposed to be at the end, exactly after. After the exile. Uh, in Malachi, after the exile, where uh, Malachi is, I think it's Malachi, saying, um, like he tells, I should have brought, brought it up, but he tells them to remember this, the law to mm-hmm. Moses and the story, or not the story, but just what, I can't remember what the verse is. Malachi should have brought it up. Anyways, the, the exhortation is to remember the, the Torah, remember the law, remember what's been happening. And then you go into Chronicles, which just chronicles through right. specifically what, whereas Kings would have been um, focusing on how the Kings kept the law, right? They, right. How faithful were they to, how, how did they do as far as being a faithful Torah follower, right. Yahweh worshiper? The Chronicles, more Chronicles, what, maybe specifically um, what someone who turns to God or someone who rejects God, like the the effects that that has on. So, for instance, in Chronicles, Manasseh is painted in somewhat of a good light, even though he's right. in Kings, the like he's the worst king ever. He's the worst ever, yeah. Um, because, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there was one moment where Manasseh repents right. <clears throat> and turns. And then there's some good kings that are painted a little negatively when they choose to right. re- resist. And so you're chronicling through that story. Right. And then you get to, to Jesus in the New Testament. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. I think Kings and Chronicles are one of the places you, where the different order helps the most probably because, yeah, Kings yeah. is asking the question. So like, how did we get to exile? Like what happened? Did mm-hmm. 
And it basically is saying, look, you know, Deuteronomy said the kings, you, you know, you need to you need to obey Torah. You need to, um, you know, not worship. You need to worship in, in Jerusalem. You need to faithful kings need to operate a certain way. And over and over, it just shows how the kings failed at keeping the stipulations of Deuteronomy. And therefore, the sort of the the point is, you know, we're just getting what we deserve. Like we're in exile because we've been unfaithful to God. Our kings have brought us, you know, down. Uh, Chronicles is, you know, being after the exile is more asking the question of, so is there hope for us? And is God is God still going to be with us mm. and stuff? And mm. so it traces the the line specifically of David and ends with, you know, this very small note of hope that there is the line of David hasn't quite died out and God's bringing his people yeah. back and we'll see what happens next kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Dr. Peter Gentry uh, helped me understand that. Understand that. And that was, that was good. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, maybe it's just, we've kind of touched on it maybe a little bit, I guess, but um, I, one of the questions that I was curious is what are, <clears throat> so we've been talking about, excuse me, I've got a little thro- frog in my throat, but we have uh, been talking about biblical theology and understanding the storyline of scripture and not taking it out of context. What are some specific aspects of understanding life as a Christian that we might easily misunderstand um, without a solid grasp of the, of the biblical storyline. And I, for me, one has been understanding what salvation is. Oh yeah. Oh, and yeah, I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are. Yeah. Salvation. Definitely. Um, definitely. And I think the other one for me, uh, suffering. Hmm. I think, um, that's been a very personal one for, yeah. uh, for me. And, uh, I think biblical theology has done a lot to help cope with that. Yeah. You care to I share mean, a little more back, on that. But yeah. yeah, so my folks, my family um, has some very difficult chronic uh, health problems. My mom, has, her health has been bad for years hmm. and has kind of in some ways been declining further and my younger sister who is now 21 ish um she she's been essentially an invalid for five Mm. years and i think um watching her go downhill years ago and she went through some really rough times almost it was a twice where she almost died and she was hospitalized for a while you know for a couple of few weeks and um just she has no life i mean and she mm-hmm. and there's we keep you know trying stuff but who knows we don't we don't know what's going to happen and mm-hmm. um i think the the hope of new creation and resurrection mm-hmm. has been has been uh the idea, the, the understanding that the scripture and salvation is not sort of an ethereal thing that we sort of believe in. Mm-hmm. Then someday, you know, we'll get taken off this earth and get, you know, have some nice disembodied yeah. existence in heaven, but rather is the restoration of creation. Um, gives a sort of a, a more of a real, a real hope for, yeah. for my family, my sister. And like, no, I mean, she's, she has no life, but it's not, you know, it's, this isn't, this isn't the only chance at life. This is, yeah. um, someday, sh- someday the, the, when the curse is removed and creation is restored, um, she will experience what God has always intended yeah. life to be, uh, yeah. through the resurrection. So I don't know. Some of that stuff I think has, has, I has helped to make real, yeah make our our faith real in yeah difficult real life difficult times so yeah yeah wow that's good that's powerful i i, I definitely 
can identify with that as well. Um, and even just seeing how the mystery or just the, the joy of the gospel, I guess, or the joy of Jesus is that God himself comes into our chaos and suffering mm-hmm. and is with us. Uh, my uh, one earpiece here is dying. So <laughs> um, just, it's so easy, at least for me. I don't know if you're familiar at all, but my mom was killed in a car accident mm. just four days before our wedding. That's incredible. And so, you know, our whole marriage has kind of been a bit traumatic, I guess you could say, uh, yeah, because of that. Be. <laughs> <laughs> and wrestling with why does God let these things happen? Why does right. he just make everything new again? Right. And seeing how... God, he is making things new again. Mm -hmm. And part of the way he's doing that is by himself coming into our pain and chaos Mm -hmm. and walking with us. Right. Yeah. So I definitely agree. Let's see. Yeah. And salvation, uh, I mean, one thing I, I mean, there's so much to say on that, but um, I, one thing I like to tell people is, you know, we got to, we too often think about applying the Bible to our lives, you know, mm-hmm. uh, kind of mm-hmm. assuming that the Bible actually doesn't really apply to our lives. And so we have to do something to make it apply to our lives, yeah. you know, where in reality, you know, the the good news of the gospel is that God has actually written us into his story. Yeah. And we don't, we, we don't try to apply this ancient document to our lives, but every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're, we're saying, yeah. Look, I was this I was this far away Gentile that has no business no business calling myself a member of God's family. But yeah. somehow I am when I eat this bread and drink this cup, I am saying that God has actually brought me into the new covenant with him. And somehow I am one of the Messiah's people and he's he's somehow cleansed my sins and given me a new heart and yeah. and promised that he's going to that he's going to, he's made me an heir of everything the Messiah is an heir of. And it's like, mm. it's mind blowing. I just because we're used to the fact that Christianity has existed in our, you know, in our culture, in our society and Western culture for 2000 years, I don't think should, should lessen the uh, sort of our amazement that, Oh my word, it's actually, we're somehow brought into this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that is so good. Well, thanks, Paul, for taking the time to come on here and, and share about this. Um, where can people find more information, particularly about the course? But uh, uh, You know, I think I'm going to do is I don't have like some I'm sort of a low key uh, okay. <laughs> tech guy. So I am going to um, what I think I'll do is have some sort of a link. Uh, that I'll give, sure. that I'll create and give to you, and you can put on the on your with on the page with this interview yeah. or whatever, and then people can go and put in their email if they want. Uh, yeah, if they want information when I do the next one or something. That sounds good. Yeah, that would be yeah. great. So we'll just have that link there for people. Yeah, something All like that. Lamachella from. Did I get that right? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, from Leola, Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Or somewhere yeah, around Lancaster there, Lancaster, area. Lancaster yep. area. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to look you up next time. I've got a sister who yep. lives in Lancaster. So. Oh, really? Oh, cool. We'll, uh, yeah, I do. Let's we'll get together. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for Thank you. meeting a, a new friend over Zoom. Yeah. Always, always happy to do that. <laughs> yeah.